Good evening and a warm welcome to tonight's edition of Beyond the Lockdown. This is the Joy News channel and it is free to air your digital terrestrial platforms. On DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144, we are live as well. And if you must leave the television set, catch the program live on myjoyonline.com or on our social media platforms, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, etc. Now, tonight we are asking if Ghana is winning the COVID war. If you carefully scrutinize Ghana's COVID-19 cases, you will notice that from August 4, the country's active cases and new cases has been on the decline. So from 4th August 2020, we had 3,528. 5th August, we have 3,313. 6th August is 3,059. 7th August, we have 3,253. 8th August is 2,625. 9th August, we have 2,458. Then on the 10th, we have 2,134. 11th August recorded 2,029 cases. Then on the 12th, we have 2,007. Just on the 13th of August, we had 1,906. Then just recently, that's on the 14th of August, the latest figures, we have 1,939. I know you get the picture, but before we get into it, I'll quickly pull up an artificial intelligence monitor of COVID-19 cases. Now, this website shows how countries are are doing based on data generated uh, from it. So it tells us about how they are controlling, emerging or winning. So the map you see, the green tells you that these countries are winning. Then uh, the yellow tells you about their status. Red is the emerging and the controlling is the orange. So let's take a look at Ghana, for instance. Ghana tells us that we are controlling. That's where we are. Then for Benin, it also tells us about how we are controlling. Then we have Nigeria. Nigeria is also controlling as we speak. So that's how it looks like. And um, we have the one for the world as well. Tells you about how New Zealand is um, recording just about a uh, all hundred percent. And then uh, we, we, the latest update, uh, for instance, uh, we have that. And then we have the emerging, which is uh, the 19%. That's for Nigeria status controlling. Nigeria is at COVID-19 stage two uh, controlling as well. Then we have uh, COVID-19 AI country monitor status. That's how it looks like. Uh, so as the world is continuing in its uh, fight against this pandemic, there is a need to know which countries and states are doing in their responses. So the last updated uh, down here, uh, emerging countries have not yet reached their peak and COVID-19 cases are sharply rising. So this is how uh, it looks like uh, for us as a country. So um, strict measures may be needed to control COVID-19. And then the last updated, uh, last updated, this is Ghana. This is where we are as a country. So Ghana, our status is controlling. Uh, that's the orange mark. This is right here. Then we have emerging, which is 13.9%. That's the, how it looks like. Then we are controlling 38.5%. That's for Ghana. So we are winning at 38.4%. So this is our status as a country on this artificial intelligence monitor. Does this mean that Ghana has COVID-19 under tight control? And what is our daily testing situation? So the Ghana Health Service once said that rising cases indicated that Ghana was doing a lot of testing. Are we aggressively testing like previously? Now, with many disregarding social distancing and wearing of face mask protocols, is it not surprising that our cases are reducing? Should we be celebrating? And what is the science of this development? Also, health analysts have criticized late reporting of COVID-19 mortality figures. We have the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Abouadji, to answer your questions. I also have the General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Dr. Justice Yangsen, on the show tonight. Information Minister Kujo Ponkrumah is also here to answer your questions as we prepare for update number 15 from President Ekofado. I'm sure you're expecting the announcement of the third phase of the easing of restrictions. You have to stay for that. That and more here on tonight on Beyond the Lockdown. I am MFA Pau. Thanks for your company once again. Let's stay tuned and we'll have details shortly.
Thanks for staying with us here on Beyond the Lockdown. This is the Joy News Channel. Like I said, the show is also live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 144, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. You can participate and then also leave your comments right there. As we go on, we'll be taking uh, your questions as well. Uh, tonight, my guest, uh, Dr. Patrick Abwaje. He's the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. He's in the studio with me tonight. Welcome, Dr. Abwaje. Also via Zoom, we have the General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Dr. Justice Yangsin, and then also the Information Minister, Kujo Oponkroma. Good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to Beyond the Lockdown. Thanks for your company. Well, Dr. Justice Yangsin, been a while since I had you uh, on the show. Uh, you've been busy uh, putting up, uh, you know, a facility disease centre uh, for Ghana. We are done with the crowd. Where is the next stop? <laughs> Dr. Justice Yangsing? Okay, yes, so you have I to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Yeah. So I was asking yes, that you, you've been busy. Definitely. And I'm asking when the next stop is. We are done with Accra. Where are we going next? We are heading to Kumase hopefully next month. Okay. Well, plans are far advanced then. How about you, Dr. Patrick Abadji? Oh, How have you been fine. doing? Yeah. You've been doing well. Yeah, have been doing well. We're managing. Well, we'll get into the questions. A lot of them <laughs> for you shortly. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kojo Ponkuma, you've been in the line of fire this weekend. How are you coping? I'm okay, Mr. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Welcome. Good to see you smiling. Well, you're welcome. So good to we'll see you as well. Let me say good evening to uh, Justice and Dr. Abwaji as well. Mm. Well, we'll get into uh, the questions so we prepare and then take um, the president's uh, address um, shortly. But I would want to find out from you uh, first, Dr. Patrick Abwaji. Uh, it looks like I've seen, I put out the figures earlier mm -hmm. in terms of the decline from the 4th of August all the way to 14. But I see that it looks like on the 14th we had uh, more cases. Uh, we had 1,939 because the previous one was 1,906. Uh, how are we doing? Because people have said that we may have a sharp decline, but it appears that maybe it's because we are not testing. Is that the case? Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, if you look at uh, the, the updates, you mm -hmm. see total number of tests done. So in between, you see the number of tests done every day, and that is still quite high. Uh, you know, there are some days it drops, but it also averages about two to 3,000 tests a day. Mm -hmm. This depends on the testing policy. The testing policy is that people who have shown symptoms and their contacts. Mm -hmm. And so if you have fewer positives today, the chances are that their contacts may be fewer, and so you may not be have to test more. Mm -hmm. But we still, the regions do at-risk testing. So if they feel there's a group that's at risk, they will test them. If the school, they feel there's um, something happening, they will go and do a test today and then see how we get, and that's how we are managing it. But how is our daily testing looking like? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's mm. nothing less than 2,000 on the average, mm. about two, 3,000. Uh, but is it that ag as aggressive as it used to be? That is, see, that is the, the policy. We mm. started with an aggressive testing because we wanted to know what's happening. Mm. So we did what we call sweeping. We went to Ayawa, so we found a positive. We do our one kilometer circle and do everybody around. Mm. And we had a lot of negatives from there because we were testing to see a community spread. We brought in high risk groups, drivers, cook sellers, etc., to test them and see what is happening. Some uh, workplaces were tested. Now we know where the risks are. Mm. Currently, we are just doing at risk, but we are focusing more on people who are presenting with conditions and immediately following up with their contacts. The original, the initial, what we call enhanced con test, contest, uh, testing, mm. the initial approach was that you wait for the person to fall sick and then you test. If they don't, you don't test them. But now we test every contact as soon as we know you are contacted. So that's still why we're doing an okay. enhanced contrast testing, just like and not every country is doing it that way. Mm. Well, this is just the preliminary as we await update number 14. I'll go to you, uh, Dr. Justice Yangsen. Uh, briefly, I would want to find out, you have the science to back the data uh, that we're seeing. I would want to find out from the Ghana Medical Association, your own assessment of uh, since we ease restrictions, we are in the second phase. We are hoping to hear the announcement of the third phase. What has been your uh, view in terms of what you've noticed when it comes to how we've done, when it comes to the easing of these restrictions? Well, MFA, as good as a country, we are trying our best to deal with the situation. It must be said that we've actually made a lot of gains, but there are still some areas we will need to keep our eyes on the ball. One major thing we have observed is that the general population, 
and with all due respect, inclusive of the media, it looks as if now we are actually beginning to reduce the communication, the education, as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Most people, you see them, you talk to them, and uh, it is as if all is well. There is no problem at hand because mm -hmm. they think that the active case count is coming down, for which reason Ghana basically is fine. But truth be told, we are not out of the woods yet. Mm. So as far as risk communication, social mobilization, education is concerned, we seem to have lost our guard a little as a people, but it's a collective activity. When you look at the adherence to the protocols, especially with the easing that occurred within, I mean, per the president's last communication to the country before today, you could see that for most places, people are beginning to not strictly adhere to the preventive measures, especially the use of masks and washing of hands, as well as the use of sanitizer. We realize that clearly a lot more people are now walking around without a mask. Yeah. We were expecting that the enforcement that was going to come along would have been a lot more stricter. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it doesn't seem to be so. And these are two areas that we need to be very wary of because as the cases seem to be going down, I'm sure you're going to interrogate, you know, a lot more as we move along. But there's always a risk of what we call a second wave. Mm -hmm. And as a people, we should ensure that we don't have a self-inflicted second wave just because we have refused to do the good things that we were doing earlier. Okay. Well, but Mr. Kwankuma, I would want to find out about government's own assessment of the impact since um, you, you eased the restrictions. We are in the second phase. I'm sure you give us a hint whether there will be a third phase tonight in terms of the reopening of borders. But let's look at the <laughs> assessment of the first and second phases just yet. Well, if I always try to beat me with questions, <laughs> but um, to respond specifically, in the first two phases that have been eased, I think what we've been doing is keeping our eye on the rate of new infections. Mm. Um, we've also been keeping our eye on people's compliance mm what you call the preventive etiquette, particularly the wearing of the face uh, covering that uh, uh, is now uh, mandatory for the Ghanaian population. Now, in terms of um, new infections, the data we have from the Ghana Health Service, essentially, is that the um, rate of new infections or the seven-day moving average curve uh, is declining. Okay. And what it does is that it kind of gives you an average every seven days of the rate of new infections that are being recorded on a daily basis. Now, if you juxtapose that with the fact that we've done about two stages of easing, it does not suggest to us that despite the easing, we're having an escalating uh, situation. The second thing is that um, the Ghana Health Service has supplied us with some data. Uh, I know the president will speak to it later tonight when he addresses us. Uh, data which was aimed at empirically finding out um, compliance levels, particularly to the wearing of the face covering. Mm -hmm. That data is also pretty encouraging and um, gives us reason to believe that if we continue with the risk communications and social mobilization, as Dr. Yangson is talking about, and uh, continue with what we we'll call the all of Ghana approach, all hands on deck, uh, we are on a good path when it comes to COVID-19 management here in Ghana. Well, so uh, should we expect a reopening of schools, for instance, and then the reopening <laughs> of our borders tonight? You always want me to speak before the president does. Um, you will hear the president speak to the subject of um, reopening of schools and the reopening of borders and perhaps explain what is going into his decision-making process. And if indeed he has arrived at a decision on those, you can uh, rest assured that uh, he will tell us what that decision is. But uh, these are matters that uh, have been on his table. The uh, COVID task force has been advising the epidemiologists, uh, the Ghana Health Service, uh, the uh, travel, may I say experts, those who are familiar with international travel and what is happening uh, around the global ecosystem. They've all been um, advising. And uh, the president will not shy away from those subjects. He will speak to them when he addresses us tonight. 
Okay, we, we, we definitely will wait for that, but there are lots of questions that we'll get into. But Dr. Patrick Abadji, you've been largely advising um, the presidency. I've heard uh, Mr. Uh, Oponkuma mention uh, some data that you've provided uh, to the president that he'll be speaking to. How does it look like? Well, I mean, generally, the, um, we have those who are wearing masks appropriately mm -hmm. and those who have masks. And if you, have, you are wearing it appropriately and not appropriately, we assume that an intention to use masks is there. Mm -hmm. And we have a number that has used masks appropriately and those who are just putting out their jaw or whatever, or holding it. And so those are the numbers we have. And we have them in several spots of the country. And we've also been to some markets to see adherence and to, to those things. And I'm sure after is the president speaks... Is it encouraging? Uh, yes, it's encouraging. But um, like Dr. Janssen said, um, people are misinterpreting the good state that we are in. We are in our best state that we can, in terms of the COVID response, in terms of the, the burden of the disease. But we started with one case. And so even if you are reporting five cases today, it's still riskier than the 12th of March. And so we need to, and we are where we are because we've done three main things. So what the health sector response has been, mm -hmm. testing, isolating, etc., treatment, uh, what the CSOs have joined, what other partners, including media, has done. On risk communication, that's one. The, the, is, uh, the support that we have received from the presidency and his team as a, as a country and as a health sector to do that. And most importantly, what the Ghanaian people have done mm -hmm. in terms of adhering to the protocols, social distancing, wearing. These are the three key arms that we are using. Mm -hmm. Anyone, we are where we are because they are all seem to be pushing. If we remove any one of them, we are going to go up again. And so this is the time that we need to strengthen uh, those things to ensure that we stay and we continue going down so that we mm -hmm. can also ease further and allow the, the country to be back to where it was. So, so we really should not uh, assume that it just happened like that. It happened because we've done things. We need to keep those things and do even more so that we can go further and be free to do our work. Well, Dr. Yangsin, uh, prior to the registration, uh, because people were, ho were, ho were scared, I shouldn't say hoping, were scared that there will be a hike uh, in the numbers after the registration. GMA even had calls to write to the EC about it, if that should happen. I, I would want to quickly find out from you, are you surprised that even after the registration, we're having a decrease in the number of cases? Or are you expecting that uh, we we'll, would we'll have a, a spike like you were hoping that we'll have before the registration? Well, Eva, I think you may have misinterpreted what we said to the EC. It was a warning. It was a caution. Was mm -hmm. A word of caution. And I think that it did help the process. Okay. Especially when the public got to know what we had written to the EC. Initially, it was a private letter to them, admonishing them of the need to ensure that we don't breach the protocols, which, unfortunately, if we did, will result in some surges. But thankfully, especially after the third, fourth day, you could realize that for most of the centers, there was a huge improvement in the way the preventive etiquette were being adhered to at those registration centers. And I think by and large, that call to them, together with what others may have actually uh, brought to the fore, which I think the EC ultimately took in good faith and ensured that there was improved adherence to the preventive etiquette at the various registration centers. Okay. It's probably one of the reasons why we are at this point not at least seeing so much in terms of the active cases that we are recording on daily basis. Mm. The call was not that the exercise at all costs was going to lead to some infection. Okay. But it was a way of preventing that in case there was anything of that nature. Because the only way we could have resulted in cases would have been if people or at the registration centers, these protocols were not adhered to. People were massing up, people were not wearing their masks, they were not washing their hands, and what have you. So by and large, I think the exercise has concluded. Some may say it's too early yet because uh, you need a bit of incubation period. But mm. we all expect God that hopefully, that. based on the adherence that especially we saw within the last, uh, I mean, post the first week, uh, all should be well with us generally. 
Okay. Well, ahead of the, the presidential address in some uh, three minutes or so, I'd want to find out if you're expecting uh, a, a reopening uh, of our borders and reopening of schools, for instance, because during the lockdown you gave an advice or so. Let's uh, quickly hear you on that before we go. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think that, like the Honorable Minister said, let's wait for the president. <laughs> we have also one way or the other advice in some, you know, directions. So let, let, let's let's wait for the president, and then once he's done, I'm sure we can all discuss the details of whatever he will put out there. We did all. But, but ahead of his announcement to... during the lockdown, you didn't wait. You advised um, openly uh, that you're hoping that that will not happen. So uh, this is a good time also to hear you on that. <laughs> we, 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 have, we, we have come a long way. Okay. The signs and data, as we all, I mean, are talking about, have moved progressively till now. And it is a continuous assessment of the situation. For example, if you are thinking about reopening your international borders, for instance, you need to look at what is happening elsewhere, especially where you have a lot of your inbound flights coming from. So okay. you, you need to look at the situation, not just within your country, but out there as well. And then when it comes to your own country, you I'm also will need to look at mm. your capacity to even do, let's say, quarantine, assuming you have thousands of people coming in on daily basis, your capacity to test all the people coming in so that you don't end up with cases being imported. So, mm. and, and that goes into the decision making. So okay. let, let's just wait patiently for the president. And then when he's done, I'm sure we can all discuss the details as uh, what you put out there. Of course. But the countdown is on. I have just about 30 seconds to go. But Dr. Bwaji, um, you, you were nodding or shaking your head to the issue about the registration and whether we are not out of the woods yet, whether in the coming uh, days we'll start recording more cases as a I, result. I, I think if you, the, the longest incubation period is about 12 days. So mm -hmm. if you would have gotten anything, it would have happened. But I wanted to add that prior to the registration, a lot of preparation had gone on. Okay. You saw the temperature gun. This for the first time, we had the health worker at every registration center to ensure that the protocols are done. This was done properly with quota, but washing hands, etc. we know what we saw from the beginning. It, people of were course, we are dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, you put a structure in it, people have to adhere. Okay. It takes time to adjust. Mm. And uh, I believe that at the end of the day, they adjusted and also the registration center, also the police, everybody, and that's mm -hmm. how and don't forget, okay. at the same time, we had school reopening. We also well, had... Well, hold on, hold yeah. on. Let's go straight <laughs> to the Jubilee House now for update number 15 from President Toko Fuado. Fellow Ghanaians, good evening. Today is the 15th time since the virus came to our country some five months ago that I've come to provide you with the status of our coordinated efforts to defeat COVID-19. I must thank you again for welcoming me into your homes. And I must repeat how proud I am to be your president in these difficult times. I appeal to all of us to continue in our individual and collective efforts to help contain the spread of the virus in our country. We've been through several phases of the fight against the pandemic. We've put in place restrictions to our everyday lives, indeed, some of which still remain, and we've gradually moved to restoring normalcy in some aspects of our lives. Over the last few weeks, the cap on the number of persons going to church and mosque has been lifted, albeit with strict social distancing. Our final year students in university, senior and junior high schools have returned to school to write their final examinations. And the Electoral Commission has just completed the successful compilation of a voter's register ahead of the conduct of the 2020 general elections in December. On behalf of the people of Ghana, I congratulate warmly the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mrs. Jean Mensah, her two deputies, Dr. Eric Asare Bosman and Mr. Samuel Tete, and the entire commission 
for the efficient, safe, transparent nature of the registration exercise. Where for the first time in our nation's history, Ghanaians were provided with daily updates of the numbers of eligible voters registered, together with specific age, gender, regional breakdowns, and breakdowns of identity documents. All eligible voters were given the unfettered opportunity to register, a process that was fully embraced by the mass of the citizenry. Of course, there were genuine and understandable concerns about conducting such a complex exercise involving millions of citizens at this time. But at the end of the day, Ghanaians did their civic duty by going out to register, having found that the process was overwhelmingly orderly, peaceful, and safe. However, there were those who expressed various degrees of hysteria and negativity towards the exercise, with some who swore heaven and earth to resist the compilation of the register at the peril of their lives, ending up registering. There were also those who offered delicate personal sacrifices in the event of the register, again ending up registering. And there were those who claimed that in the midst of a pandemic, the registration exercise should not be conducted with some warning of an explosion in our case count and very high numbers of deaths should the exercise go ahead. By the grace of God, the work of the Electoral Commission and the effective measures put in place by government, these prophecies of doom did not materialize. There were nonetheless deeply regrettable, isolated incidents of violence, which I condemn unreservedly, and which I expect the police to deal with without fear or favor. But the exercise was generally peaceful. The Ghanaian people have, by the conduct of this exercise, demonstrated our commitment once again to consolidating our status as a beacon of democracy on the continent and in the world. The professional Jeremiahs and naysayers who seek cynically to make a profitable industry out of spreading falsehoods, fear and panic, stoking divisive ethnic sentiments, underestimate the resolve and the determination of Ghanaians to build a united, democratic, peaceful, prosperous, and happy Ghana. We will continue to work hard to prove them wrong. Fellow Ghanaians, when I delivered update number 14, some three weeks ago, I indicated that a closer look at the data points to the fact that we are steadily on the path towards limiting and containing the virus and ultimately defeating it. And I requested all of us to pay particular attention to the number of active cases. As of 24th July, the number of active cases, i.e. persons with the virus, stood at 3,307. As of Saturday, 15th August, three weeks later, the number of active cases stands at 1,847. This is a clear indication that government policies are working. Currently, there are no recorded COVID-19 cases in the Northeast, Savannah, Upper East, and Upper West regions. And I charge their residents to do everything possible to maintain that situation. Greater Accra, Ashanti, Central, Eastern, and Western continue to be the regions with the highest number of active cases. Thus far, a total of 40,000
567 persons have recovered from the virus. This means our recovery rate has improved from 89.5% to 95.1% in three weeks. Our death rate continues massively to be low at 0.5%. Happily, there are no backlogs of tests at any of our testing centers, meaning the situational reports are up to date. Indeed, test results that used to take weeks are now available within 48 hours. We have so far conducted 427,121 tests. These statistics undermine as unfounded the claim that Ghana has lost the battle to defeat COVID-19. There can be only one simple reason for this baseless assertion, and that is political expediency. But as I have said before, do not begrudge those who make such statements. They need to make them to continue to try to stay relevant. Our health workers will forever be in our debt for the dedication they have put in to ensure these impressive statistics. We can help them even further by continuing to adhere to the social distancing and hygiene protocols we have instituted to stem the tide of infections. I've been encouraged by the results of a recent survey conducted by the Ghana Health Service into the use of face masks at selected locations in Accra in the month of August. It revealed that the overall intention to use face masks at the site surveyed was very high, with 82% of persons surveyed possessing a mask. I believe we can do even more and better and reach 100%. However, the same survey demonstrated that only 44.3% of those who have the mask use them correctly. I urge each and every one of us to wear our masks and do so correctly any time we leave our homes. It is the new normal requirement of our daily existence until the virus disappears. Our faced approach towards returning our lives to normal through the strategic, controlled, progressive, and safe easing of restrictions will thus continue. Most final year university students have already completed their examinations. And by 18 September, SHS3 and JHS3 students would have finished their respective final examinations of WACSE and BECE. As a result of reports I have recently received that some final year JHS students were going hungry in complying with COVID-19 protocols, I've just instructed the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection to begin preparations to ensure that as from 24th August up to 18th September, all 584,000 final year JHS students and 146,000 staff, both in public and private schools, be given one hot meal a day. This is to ensure full observance of the COVID-19 safety protocols. Through online learning portals, almost all continuing students in our universities have completed their studies for the, the academic year. The exceptions are the University of Cape Coast, the University of Health and Allied Sciences, technical universities, and some other colleges. After extensive stakeholder consultations, the decision has been taken for continuing students in these tertiary institutions to return to school on 24th August to finish their academic year. Just as was done for final year students who return to school, 
government through the Ministry of Education and the Ghana Education Service, will ensure that all these tertiary institutions are disinfected. Universities will be equipped with the necessary personal protective equipment, and those with their own hospitals and clinics will have isolation centers to deal with any positive cases. All other institutions without their own clinics and hospitals will be mapped to health facilities. There will be no mass gatherings and no sporting activities. Religious activities under the new protocols will be permitted. Social distancing and the wearing of face masks must become the norm on campus. The Ministry of Education continues to engage the Ghana Education Service and all relevant stakeholders to conclude discussions on the modalities surrounding the opening of our pre-tertiary schools. I will communicate in due course the decisions that will be reached from these consultations. You can be rest assured that I will always take into prime consideration the safety and well-being of our children, teachers, and non-teaching staff in the decisions that will be taken, because I'm determined to ensure that the education of our children is not unduly disturbed by this pandemic. I know many still ask whether our borders, especially our international airport, Kotoka International Airport, will be open. Under my instructions, the Ministry of Aviation, the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, and the Ghana Airports Company Limited have been working with the Ministry of Health and its agencies to ascertain our readiness to reopen our airport. I want to ensure that we are in a position to test every single passenger that arrives in the country to avoid the spread of the virus. The outcome of that exercise will show us the way and determine when we can reopen our border by air. I'm hoping that by God's grace, we'll be ready to do so by the 1st of September. Until further notice, our borders by air, land and sea remain closed to human traffic. For Ghana residents stranded abroad, special dispensation will be continue to be given for their evacuation back to Ghana, where they will be subjected to the mandatory quarantine and safety protocols. Beaches, pubs, cinemas, and nightclubs are still to remain closed until further notice. The limit on the number of persons who can attend conferences, workshops, and award events has now been lifted subject to the maintenance of social distancing amongst participants, fresh air ventilation of the premises, and a two-hour limit for each session. I know that the pandemic has adversely affected many lives and livelihoods. It is for this reason the government has implemented several measures, such as free water and electricity, and funding to support small businesses and tax relief, amongst others, to cushion the effect of the pandemic. We are not providing freebies. We are providing critical help to households, families, and businesses in the midst of this pandemic because we care. It is my conviction that in times of crises, it is the duty of a responsible and sensitive government to protect the population and provide relief. Fellow Ghanaians, let us remember at all times that the faced opening up of our country continues to put an obligation and responsibility on each one of us to remain vigilant and respect the enhanced hygiene, mask wearing and social distancing protocols that have become part and parcel of our daily routine. They are proving to be effective, so let us employ them wholeheartedly. 
That is the way we can restore as quickly as possible the blessings of normalcy for which we all yearn. There is no room for complacency. We must be very much on our guard because some countries have experienced spikes after recording major achievements in containing the spread of the virus. We should not go down that road. Social distancing, enhanced hygiene and wearing of masks are obligatory for each one of us. And you know, Ms. Ramo, in she say, I am here, if I mask no one, moon diso. So free if you are, she mask no. And no, the bad boy, you hold by. I'm a you to me up, Pam Yare, if you am. And you mean, me, me, Pam Yafai, but you are no new auto, a ham mask, no, you no ni ba wa wo ni wonye wo hwe hela na e ke je wo ma na mi ga me ni nye ye ho mo wo mi ha nye fe afi o afi fellow ganans the remarkable nature of us the ganan people the first colonized people in sub saharan africa to gain their freedom and independence from foreign rule is manifesting itself again. In the midst of the pandemic, we have been able to compile a voter's register, arguably the most credible voter register in our history. Our democratic institutions continue to function effectively. There continues to be vigorous public debate on issues of public policy. Respect for the rule of law continues to be central to our governance. Our economy, despite the severe shocks of the pandemic, is proving to be resilient and is poised for rapid recovery. Our agriculture is performing so that despite the disruptions of the pandemic, food is still abundant in our markets and the virus itself is being forced systematically. Indeed, a stronger, healthier Ghana is being built before our very eyes, and the great majority of Ghanaians can see it. Let us continue down this path so that the dreams of freedom and prosperity that inspired the great patriots who founded our nation can find expression in our generation. We can do it. So let us continue to work hard towards attaining our goal. This too shall pass, for the battle is the Lord's. May God bless us all in our homeland, Ghana, and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention, and good night. So just gone by is update number 15 from President Nanado Dankwa Akufado. I still have my guests here in the studio. Uh, they told me to wait till the president speaks, and then we can interrogate some of the things that will come up. Dr. Justice Yang Sin, Ghana Medical Association General Secretary. Dr. Patrick Kabwaje is also with me here in the studio. And the Information Minister, Kujo Ponkuma, is also on hand uh, to give us some clarity, some of the areas uh, that uh, you may not understand. You can keep your questions coming in. So, Ms. Ponkuma, I would first uh, want to uh, find out from you. I've heard the president uh, speak about a number of things, one hot meal a day uh, for our children, starting from 24th of August. That's for JHS3 uh, students, those who are in school as we speak, 584,000 of them and 146,000 staff. Uh, we are going to get that and continuing students in a number of universities are also returning to school on the 24th of August. Uh, Borders, uh, the KIA, the aviation, uh, GCA, and then also the Ghana airport have been asked to ascertain our readiness to reopen. So tell us, um, we, he says that for now they remain close to human traffic and he is hopeful that from the 1st of September it will be reopened. So what is it? 1st September our borders will be opened? Mm -hmm. The target that the president is setting is the 1st of September. Mm -hmm. But some amount of work needs to be done between now and the 1st of September to put us in a position where we can confidently do that. And therefore, you always have to look at the data. On a daily basis, about 7,000 passengers pass through the Kotoka International Airport. Half of them are coming in, half are going out. That's about 3,500. 
if you extrapolate that by seven days in a week, it gives you the sheer number of people who are coming into the Ghana jurisdiction on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. If you're going to follow pillar number one of our containment strategy, which is to limit the importation of cases into the Ghanaian jurisdiction, what it means is that while you want to open the borders, you want to ensure that the opening of the borders does not now allow a flood of new cases to come in. Because then what will happen is that you'll be defeating all the work that has been done so far. So for the 24,500 people that you're expecting to come through Kotoka on a weekly basis, you're going to have to put in place a number of layers of protection. Will they have to test wherever they are before they emplane to Ghana? When they get to Ghana, will they have to test again? Um, assuming you have a certain percentage of them who are positive, mm -hmm. say, for example, 10%, and if you use the 10% of those who went into mandatory quarantine, say, for example, 10%, do you have the capacity, 2,450 every week, to contain these positive cases and assist them with supportive treatment? All of these are the considerations that he has tasked the various agencies that you mentioned to put in place systems to ensure that we can therefore test everybody who is coming to the Ghanaian jurisdiction and make a determination whether this person can go into the general population mm -hmm. or must be um, uh, quarantined. And that's the work he's expecting them to do between now and the 1st of September. Okay, so Dr. Patrick Abwaji, uh, he, he, the, the issue about special dispensation still opening and then also being able, we, have, we are in the position to test every single passenger, 2,450 of them like Kojo Hospital. Do we really have the capacity? Uh, yes, yes, we do. You see, we are also reducing risk. Mm -hmm. People who are coming are going to come in with a PCR negative test before you emplane. Mm -hmm. So the number of risks is significantly reduced. And then we have putting systems in place to be able to test everybody, irrespective of a negative, uh, which is about 72 hours. You'll be tested and then uh, you also... Per week, yeah. plus the number of tests that we have yeah, to Yeah, we can do mm -hmm. uh, a day. Mm -hmm. A day we have uh, the putting up a system that allows... Uh, as many people to be tested as they come in. There'll be a, maybe a 10, 15 minute delay, but they'll all be tested and they'll receive their results. And that ready. will also be free? No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. So uh, the issue about no backlogs of tests, and then yeah. we are told that it's 48 hours. For instance, in the Upper East and Upper West, we are told that there are no cases yeah. there, uh, together with um, Savannah and the Northeast region, yeah. from what I've heard uh, from the president. But we are told that some people have tested and their results are not yet in. How then do we declare that we do not have any cases there? I don't know what, um, who those uh, people are. Mm -hmm. We've cleared all the backlog and given them the information. Like we said, those who were tested six weeks ago, they may have been given the information, they may have gone back, or they may have probably not be able to treat. But every test that has been done, had been done about two weeks ago, we had gone all the way up to the 6th of July, and that's our last week, we cleared all backlogs. And mm -hmm. so those who do not have, will probably have to approach the district where the samples were taken. Uh, if they went through the appropriate procedure mm -hmm. to have themselves tested, it will be in our, it will be in our software and the saw marks, and they will all be given their results. So if you have not received your results, you should approach wherever you took your sample was taken to ensure that the results are given to you. We don't have any backlog left. All tests have been done. Okay. Well, Dr. Yangsen, I'll come to you shortly on your general view on what you've heard. But Mr. Kujo Ponkuma, I've heard also uh, that workshops, award events uh, can be held two hours and all. Beaches, pubs, cinemas, nightclubs remain closed. But what about burials, rallies and festivals? If we are lifting the workshop awards event, does it include rallies and festivals? And what happens to burials? Does it still remain private? And the number still at the, that, that limit? So burials remain private. Mm -hmm. Festivals and political rallies, as they were banned in the original executive instrument, remain banned until further notice, in addition to the beaches and other uh, items that you've mentioned. But let me just say something to Dr. Um, Aborji. And Dr. Aborji, you are aware the president is clear that uh, while yourself and the uh, doctors generally express that there's a capacity, he's asking that there be a proper demonstration yeah. of it uh, prior to the 1st of September, yes, uh, so that he will be in a position to take... Uh, how will that be done? How is he expecting, how is he expecting that a, to we'll be done? We'll do a simulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll do a simulation. Okay. This week and yes. see how the... Mm. Well, that, and the president is looking very keenly on the success of that simulation, because if it is not successful, then what you would have done is that you have opened the doors of risk to the Ghanaian population. He's very concerned about 
the next risk level and it's asking for that proper demonstration that's why i'm repeating it and we're hopeful that so far the kind of work that um dr Boadji and his team have done they will do it one more time so that we can uh, achieve the president's target of 1st September. Okay. Dr. Yangsin, I'll come to you uh, on this uh, briefly. Then we'll go for our first break. When we return, the floods of questions that have come in, loads and loads of them, we can quickly go through some of them. Generally, uh, what you've heard, you're satisfied with it, especially uh, this issue about us being in the position to test every single passenger uh, that will come in should we reopen the borders from the 1st of September. Yes, I think that one thing we need to all understand at this point is that our testing capacity has to be robust at this point. Mm. Reason is that we are not just dealing with the info that we are going to get once the airport is open. As we ease the restriction, we should be in a, in a position to test as many people as possible as and when the need arises. For example, we are going to get the continuing students to go back to school, those in the tertiary institution. These are huge numbers. Nobody is praying that they get an infection in there. But in case there are any fallout, we should be in a position to do safe. Mm. As we see other restrictions, conferences, what have you, what it means is that anytime there is a need for us to test, we need to be able to test. Mind you, within the clinical setting, as we speak, we are still getting cases from the general community as well. And like we had discussed earlier, there is a need for some enhanced contact tracing and what have you for such issues. Okay. So what this actually means is that we need to ensure that our capacity to test is at its best. We have had challenges in the past. We have improved. Mm. But as we move to open up a lot more, we should all be mindful that just as the Spain, the France of this world are experiencing, there's what we call the second wave as far as pandemic are concerned. And this is one thing here that we're very careful about. So we, we, we need to ensure that within the framework, as the president has just mentioned, all the players in there do the due diligence. And from my understanding of what the president has said, until he's satisfied with whatever outcomes of their deliberations, first September is still hanging out there. Okay. That is my understanding. Okay. So we, we need to ensure that we do that. Okay, so in some two weeks, uh, we'll get to know that. But uh, Dr. Baji, at some point, we ran out of reagents. You told us that it's a worldwide issue. If they come in and they test, how long will it take? And will they be in mandatory quarantine? You've talked about the stimulation. I'm sure all these will come up. Yeah, um, what we are looking at is something that will give us very rapid results, so mm -hmm. that doesn't take too long. And it's, um, see, it's also because it's going to be commercialized, mm -hmm. because we are paying for it, we can okay. put in as many equipment as possible that will deal with that. And that's what we are looking at, as many uh, equipment that will respond to, to the numbers that are, that are coming. And there are systems. And remember, it's not just about testing at the airport. It's mm -hmm. crowd control. It's about um, airport, uh, port health authority being able to assess risk. Those who are sick moved to some other place. All those things have been done. Temperature control. Mm -hmm. The departure side is virtually done properly. All shields have been raised to ensure that there's really protection between people working and others. So a lot has been done. What is left is just the testing to ensure that. We say we'll do a test run okay. to ensure that how long if you have 200 people in a flight, mm -hmm. how long would it take you to test all of them and move through? And how long that they course? will get their results? Yes, and that's and the testing. That result. period, I mean, we are actually looking at not the testing, mm -hmm. you getting your results. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how and long that's, are you looking at? Uh, we are looking at between 15 25 minutes. We should finish. Then you get your test results. Yes, and because then. it's not going to do just one person at a time. Okay. The test will be doing many tests at the same time. Okay. Because you know. You are employing the pooling system again? No, 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 okay, no. <laughs> no pulling okay, system. Okay. And so, I mean, if you have, say, you have a 200 machines to do the work, mm -hmm. maybe you just respond to it. Okay. So I don't think that is, but we'll so do a simulation 10, to ensure. 15 minutes, you should get to Make sure run. that we are able to, to look at that. Well, once you do the, the test run, we do the simulation, mm -hmm. we can guess the, the real time that it will take to, to get it done. But we believe that to be fast mm -hmm. enough not to cause a clock. But that will give us the, the capability to test all. And that is extremely important that nobody's going to get out without being tested, even though you may have come with a negative 
PCR test. So everybody will be tested before you, you get into to pick your bags and get. But, but this issue about the incubation period, for instance, so if they are coming in at a time and they are still incubating, you will still be able to detect that it's, they have it. See, what we are doing is not risk elimination. Okay. It's risk reduction. Okay. Okay, and so. That's why you have to say you have to take one within 72 hours of arrival, mm -hmm. and then when you get there, we test you. And so you're still going to be able to pick uh, a significant number. So mm -hmm. all we are doing is reducing risk to the barest minimum, but nobody say we are just eliminating, eliminating. the risk. And so how expensive would it be? Um, I'm not. I can't. I can't do nothing about that one. But we, okay. we'll look at it, and okay. the airport co uh, company will be looking at that. And so. Mm -hmm. I'll bring in the audience at this point right after this um, quick break here on Beyond the Lockdown. They will get into your life questions that you've been sending in. Thanks so much for your company. It's still Beyond the Lockdown here on the Joy News channel. And we've been talking about the gains that we have made and then how to sustain it. And then also interrogating the figures, the decline in COVID-19 infections in the country. Also gone by has been update number 15 by President Hanado Danko Kufado. A number of announcements have been made and continuing students will return to school, some tertiary institutions from 24th of August. And your children at the JHS3 level, I have one there. Uh, they'll be getting one hot meal, all 584,000 of them, plus 146,000 staff. They'll be getting one hot meal. That includes both public and private JHS um, schools. And then hopefully on the 1st of September, once Dr. Abwajin and his team do what they are suspected of them, we'll get to reopen our borders on the 1st of September. That's KIA. That's what we've heard so far. Beaches pubs, cinemas and nightclubs remain closed and there's no uh, rallies and festivals are also there's still that ban on them. Uh, that's where we are in terms of uh, the updates that we've just uh, received. Our active cases as at Saturday 15th of August is 1847. 1847 uh, that's where we stand. There's been some warm congratulations also uh, to Madame Jean Mensa and her team, Dr. Bosman Asari and Samuel Tete uh, for a successful compilation of a voters register uh, quite a summary of what uh, we've we've heard from the president if you missed it but don't worry uh, mr pukojo ponkuma the information minister is with us here on beyond the lockdown we also have dr justice yang sin is the general secretary of the ghana medical association and also the director general of the ghana health service dr patrick abwaje is my guest in the studio here the rest are with us via zoom so let's get into uh, the first batch of questions at this point i still have more questions but as we go on i'm sure we'll get to exhaust all of them thankfully i have an extension also so don't worry your questions will be answered we'll get into the first batch now what's up this one says good evening i am edwin from ablekuma and i want to ask dr Abwaji how long it takes for covid results to be released because i did a covid test at the achimota hospital about a month ago and the still test result is still not in god bless you too I have another one from Susie. Private school teachers have not been paid since March. Some of us have also been relieved of our post. Is government not concerned about our plights? One more says, what is our real estimated death rate since deaths are reported rather late and others die from complications? Uh, this one also says, the question goes to Dr. Yangsen. What is your current rate of COVID-19 infection among doctors? Well, I, I ended with you, Dr. Patrick Abadji. So let me go to Dr. Justice Yangsen. Uh, doctor infections is a question that came for you. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to put out figures at this moment. What we did previously that we put out was for a certain period. We are still collating the figures, which hopefully at the end of the month, or even probably before the end of this month, we're going to come out with it. The way we operate is that we collate data from all regions mm -hmm. and uh, as we see i don't have all the data we made and we also haven't analyzed what we have received as of yet because we do it in blocks so it will be a bit premature to say that this is the way and of course 
some doctors have been infected. As we speak, there are some doctors who are actually on treatment at this point in time. But in terms of the specific rate and figures, I think we'll put down that out uh, in a couple of weeks to come. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Kujopongkuma, there's also a question on private teachers and whether government is not concerned about their plight. Some of them say they've been relieved of their post. They haven't worked since March. Uh, private teachers, is there any plan for them? Yes, the government is putting together what we call the unemployment insurance scheme um, for some categories of workers who have lost their jobs or their incomes as a result of uh, COVID-19. And I'm sure as soon as uh, we get cabinet approval for it, maybe at uh, tomorrow's cabinet meeting, we'll be able to put out the details. The president makes a point in his address tonight, which I hope we don't lose sight of, by the fact that he is of the firm conviction that what a responsible government must do is that in times of crises, you protect livelihoods and you provide reliefs. So, for example, this um, unemployment insurance uh, that uh, we are hoping to get cabinet approval for and roll out is part of those reliefs that His Excellency feels very strongly about uh, should be made available to support the Ghanaian, like, uh, you know, those who are private school teachers, etc., in these difficult times. And he makes a clear distinction that um, we're not in the business of giving freebies. We are giving critical help. support mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to families, to businesses, to households in these tough times. Well, we're hoping to hear something on the reopening uh, of schools. Uh, for instance, we've heard the continuing students at the tertiary level. Uh, we didn't hear anything on when schools will be open. Well, since we're on private uh, teachers, they, they raised this issue during the week. Uh, we didn't hear anything on that. Or maybe did I miss it? Two or three things to say about schools. First is the fact that for the tertiary institutions, the continuing students are now going to go in, I think, from the 24th of August, depending on the school timetable, and commence their new academic year. The second category is the um, junior high school final year students who are writing exams. And the feedback um, the president has received is that um, in the quest to enforce uh, the COVID-19 preventive etiquette, um, some students are literally going hungry. Because you do know that as much as possible, we're trying to avoid students going out of campus and coming back in, for example, during lunch break, etc. And that is why the president has taken this unprecedented decision that a meal a day be made available for all of these students, even including those in private schools. As a policy decision, it is very significant because you don't ordinarily have that being done. But it is to ensure that they can follow the preventive etiquette um, and not increase risk on school campuses on school days. Mm. That is why uh, this one um, warm meal is being provided. Now, for those at the lower levels of education, the president mentions, and if I just may read, he says, the Ministry of Education continues to engage the Ghana Education Service and all relevant stakeholders to conclude discussions on the modalities surrounding the reopening of our pre tertiary schools. So once they have okay. clarity, and then if I can glean anything from even my conversation with Dr. Boji tonight, the president wants demonstrable roadmaps. Mm. Don't come just explain and say we've got it under control. He's got his hands on the deck. He wants to follow through each process. And so for the um, uh, basic schools, for example, he's asking for some more clarity to answer a few questions. I know um, Matthew Pokupempe and his team, they've done a fantastic job. They've done like four different presentations of scenarios. Uh, the president and his team keep, keep, keep interrogating that. So specific to that one, once he's satisfied that they have a firm thumb on it, he will then proceed to give the policy uh, decisions to, um, you know, to those users. Okay. So, Dr. Abwaje, uh, you had two questions in this first batch. Uh, the issue about the death rate reporting, uh, because it looks like mm -hmm. there's some people die before we uh, report and know, and then how long it takes for us to get a test result. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Every test, every death that is recorded is added to what we have. Okay. And so they normally will audit it and they add. But that's why you don't get the, the, the report the day the person died. Mm -hmm. But once the results come in, they are added, audited, then they die. So that's what we have, the 33, 31. As you compute with the number of cases, it comes to 0 0.5. Global average is about 2% 2, 2 plus. So, um, so far, that's, uh, the, that's what it is. Um, the test results? The test results. Um, you see, when you do the test, we have a repeat number, we complete your mobile, we take your mobile number, etc. So the system would have generated a test and sent to you. 
Uh, we will need to check. Like I said, you should go back. If your number is wrong, you may not receive your results, etc. So we don't, I don't know what really happened. But yes, he did it at Achimota, and he's not the only one. We've had a number of uh, people reporting yes, that yes. they test and they never get their results. Yes, yes. And so that's what I'm saying. Go back, and then we'll but be ideally, able to. But ideally, how long then, should it take? Within 48 hours, you should Within get. I mean, until the, the time that the person was talking about, those were the clock A times. Those were times we had challenges. But in the last one or two weeks, we've been able to catch up. You've seen that if you look at the updates, mm. we don't report the number of tests by date, which was running sometime across a month. Mm. But now we're just uh, reporting within 48 hours uh, of tests done. So yeah. if you don't have it, please follow up. Even if you give us your, our, our name, maybe through you, we should be able to follow up through and, and let you know what your results I'm sure you're is. watching us now. Um, you've heard Dr. Patrick Abwaje. If you've tested and within the last 48 hours and you've not received your results, let us know. So we interrogate the claim uh, made by uh, Dr. Patrick Abwaje. But at this point, let's get into the next batch of questions. We'll take as many questions as possible tonight. And this one is on WhatsApp. What is the projected outlook with regard to infections and deaths? And what could this mean for school reopenings and increase in mass gatherings seen in the past weeks coupled with possible reopening of borders? Still on WhatsApp, has there been a mutation of the virus since it was first detected in Wuhan? Mm -hmm. How do we reconcile fewer number of infections with an increasing positivity rate? And this one, how are we doing with respect to bed occupants, first at isolation centers and at hospitals? Okay, so um, it looks like most of this goes to you and then maybe uh, Dr. Justice Yangsin. So uh, bed occupant infections and all. Dr. Justice Yangsin, you have your men on the ground. Uh, how does it look like? Well, there, there, there are two sets of patients we are dealing with. The severe to critical patients, they tend to stay in, in longer. Uh, our ICU, depending on the numbers at the time, sometimes are full, sometimes are half full. But for those critical to severely ill ones, mm -hmm. they, they spend longer periods. For the mild moderate ones, usually, because of the new discharge protocol that we are using, 14 days thereabout, most of them are home. And that has actually reduced the occupancy rate at certain times in the course of, say, a month. Because people are being discharged on regular basis, the initial extreme pressure that were on the few beds seems to have come down. But that is because of the new discharge policy. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, so Dr. Patrick Abadji, uh, yeah. fewer infection as against the positivity rate, mutation of the virus, and projected outlook um, they talk about. Well, I, I think let me continue from the bed occupancy. Mm -hmm. I, I think even after the, the discharge policy, we had still high numbers. And just to reconcile the positivity, the low positivity rate, Ga East, which normally takes about 100, but averages about 60 a time, currently has less than 15 uh, people uh, on admission. So mm -hmm. that tells you that the, we are having some mild reduction, as you see. Because our reporters uh, have been there. And, yes, um, uh, can it's quite low. And it's not just the other places, Kumasi, etc. the numbers are, are down. A lot of our uh, treatment centers are, are closed down. I say that very cautiously, but I don't want to create the impression that we are out of the woods and so mm -hmm. everyone just go ahead. So, but we just want to also share uh, the information that that is what is really is and that the positivity is low. Uh, I know that uh, Joy FM is very, very fascinated with R0. The WHO <laughs> R0 as at the 13th is at 0 0.54. Okay. Which means that two people have to be, two people, we need two people to infect one person. one person. And that is quite a significant. We have drawn, as at the 10th, of August, it was 0 0.6, now 0 0.5. So we are coming down, but we are doing that because of what we are doing. I think we need to take notes of, of that. Um, has the virus mutated? That's our projection. So our projection based on all this is that mm -hmm. we, all things being equal, we should continue to see a decline. But we need to do exactly what we are doing and is even do mutation? more. Has it mutation, changed? not to our knowledge, okay. but they are not the same. Okay. 
What, what uh, when Noguchi did their projection, they saw one that is the, the Norwegian one, but broadly, from our indication, is that it's still uh, not in Ghana that the same virus is there. Mm. Um, and then we talk about the projected outlook on infection. Yes. Uh, with regard to no to infections and deaths and what could this mean yes. uh, for school reopening? So that's, and that's what I'm just saying that based on the positivity rate, mm -hmm. based on the number of new infections, mm -hmm. now the number recovering on the average exceeds the number of positive and that's why we are continuing to in increasing, getting declining pos uh, active cases. Mm -hmm. If we do everything, then the projection will be that we continue to have a reduction. When schools reopen, it's not just open like that. There are stringent measures that are put in place okay. to ensure that even when there's an infection, the response is rapid. That you saw in the first group when the, the, the final years reopened. And so the same system will be in place to, to, to contain uh, all so that. So as they, they write their exams, are we still recording cases in our schools? Um, it has significantly come down, significantly come down especially schools that are maintained the protocol of not allowing people to come in. Mm -hmm. And so we are recording relatively few people. Once in a while, you have a little here and there, we but from the, from the beginning, uh, from what we had, in the, they are sporadic. And I will, one of them talk about probably 10, even 10 schools that are reporting. I get daily updates and that they are just uh, was very the last few. Time you, got, you got an update? Every daily, day. So Friday. So today, even today, today, so today how have many? A, no, I have every day for ten regions. Okay. And so someone has to be had to compile before mm -hmm. we to, but we all present situation reports every day. Okay. And I'm sure by 10 p.m. every region would have delivered their situation report, including bed occupancy, including uh, SHS students who are positive, mm -hmm. who are tested positive. So we are doing that, but we are not seeing. But and the same go for the health staff. We are also not seeing the the number of infections that we started from, because uh, adherence to PPE and availability of PPE has all improved. So those are things that we are happening. But we need to continue doing exactly what we are doing, do more okay. to be able to sustain okay. this game. So, so. so Mr. Ponkuma, I'll come to you. I'll have a quick break also uh, before uh, we continue. Uh, on registration, I've seen a question that is asking whether the military are still at the borders or they've been withdrawn because the registration is over. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the military deployment that we're supposed to ensure that we are protected from terrorism. That was Operation Conquer Fist, uh, combined with a deployment for um, COVID-19 uh, border closure protection mm -hmm. is still in force. Okay. Well, on that note, we'll take a quick break. But Dr. Wadi, you were thinking about this, the Russian vaccine, uh, whether it's worth looking into uh, for us as a country. We've heard people already uh, started ordering. So chew on that. We'll come back <laughs> after the break. Welcome back. And our next part of questions already. But before then, Mr. Ponkuma, uh, can in-person graduation be conducted since uh, continuing students are returning to school? I don't quite get that question. If you can come again. So graduations. We know that um, our continuing students are returning to school from the 24th of August. So they're asking if they can now start conducting graduations in person. If I were a lawyer for any of these schools, I would um, advise that uh, if they will qualify as a conference, or as any of those exempted activities, uh, and then you have a facility that can accommodate a particular number mm -hmm. um, while observing social distancing, then there will be room to fit it into one of those. It is not a clearly outlined band activity, as you would have funerals or political gatherings or rallies. Uh, and so if, if, if the definition of these graduation ceremonies uh, will qualify under any of the ones that uh, have been eased this evening, uh, then it could apply. Okay, so some parents are also asking what actually is the closing time for those, the, the junior high school students, JHS3 students who are in school. Uh, we earlier were told that it's one, but we are hearing some schools are not allowing the children to close at one. Uh, they are going beyond three. Some are also asking for studies fees, uh, extra classes fees from these children. Um, I won't hazard a guess because I honestly don't know. I would uh, circle to uh, my colleague, uh, Matthew Poco Prempe, so that we have some more clarity on that and maybe you can inform your uh, viewers later because I don't have an answer to that. Okay, so Russian vaccine? Well, um, any vaccine um, that will come into this country, uh, the service, the ministry, and the FDA in particular will have to look at the dossier of the vaccine in terms of safety, reliability, etc. When they are satisfied, they will look at it. And so it will be looked at just like any medicines are looked at. 
looking at the dossier, but I'm sure they have a large dossier that people can chew on to say exactly how it was done, what are the risks, what is it, and then uh, a decision will be made. We, so we haven't um, started ordering or anything of the sort? Oh, no, 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 you, you need to go so. through the long process of um, validation and uh, looking at the dossier before you take a decision. We no, haven't okay. done that yet. But is it potent? Have you looked at it? Have we started studying? Well, I mean, the Russians say it's good, and mm. uh, that's what they say, but for when it comes to that, you need to look, go through the dossier and look at it and see how what it is, and then mm. take a decision on that. Okay. I want to hear from you, Dr. Justice Yangson, on how we are hoping to sustain the gains that we have made. Yes, there may be a decline. There are concerns about the, number, uh, the, the COVID deaths and how we keep it for too long in terms of the announcement and how traumatic it is. I would want to find out from the Medical Association, uh, if you were to advise government like you do all the time, how are we hoping to sustain the gains that we have made so that there's no, we don't relapse of a sort? Well, the, 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 the first thing we need to do do is to look at our protocols and the way things have been structured. We have made a lot of gains throughout the match that we have gathered a lot of experience as well. We do not go back on the positive direction to keep with the good things that we are doing. Now, if we are going to do that, then it means we need to start from the basis, i.e. the general population. As they say, prevention is better than control. If we all change our approach to life in the midst of COVID, i.e. follow the preventive etiquette as they ought to be, mm -hmm. then we are quite sure that we are going to limit the number of infections. The second level is that the health service system should also be in a position to mop up any seeming problems that may emanate along the line so that we can deal with them quickly and make sure that those communities do not become a problem for us. At this point, what we need to pay attention to is the potential pitfall that we inflict us, i.e. the fact that we go to sleep and then suddenly we wake up one day and we have a full-blown problem on our hands. Mm. That is what has been described as the second wave. We need to ensure that we go forward with that situation. And what that means is that we need a collective effort of both parties, i.e. the citizens and the state. The citizens, like I said, will have to play their bit by ensuring that they adhere to all the preventive measures. The easing of restriction does not mean we are out of the woods yet. I think we need to get that one very clear. We are not. We have made a lot of gains, but we shouldn't make the mistake of falling back into a trap. Okay. So we should all adhere to what we've been doing. The media should continue to intensify the campaign. Risk communication, social mobilization should continue. And then in the midst of the restrictions, people who understand that we still don't have our normal life that we had some time back. Okay. As for the health service and the state, we need to continue to provide the resources that we need. So within the health sector arrangement, the provision of PPE, drugs, the testing, and all the bits that we've been talking about, we still will need to provide these things and ensure that at the end of the day, the practitioners or the health personnel are protected. The patient who will come in will also have the required treatment as we have done all this while. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, at the various treatment centers, whatever support that they need to ensure that they do what is required of them is also done. There is this seeming complacency that we were seeing, especially over the last one to two weeks. Even within some health facilities or the health setup, you can see, or the professionals, you can see that in some facilities, things were beginning to relax. We should not fall into that trap of being complacent. Okay. Just as the general population is also beginning to get complacent in certain things. No, we should all keep to what we are doing. We should double our efforts and make sure we defeat the virus once and for all. Mm. But as we open up, we should be very, very mindful of importation of people. And that is why I agree that very strict measures should be put in place such that anybody who comes in, even if for some reason you flip through the net and you are positive, 
you'll be able to pick you up quickly such that you don't spread the disease among the community members as we have now. So these are very critical things. Okay. Well, I'm sure Mr. Opongoma and Dr. Patrick Apwadi, I don't know if you are surprised as I am that uh, one of the Beyond the Lockdown shows that we haven't had complaints about PPE. Uh, <laughs> especially with G especially GMA from the GMA. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that, uh, or, or is this still there? Or how come it's not coming up prominently tonight? Well, well, well the, the truth is that mm -hmm. the situation has improved compared to some months ago. Okay. But of course, like we keep saying, these are single use items, a lot of them are consumable. So, as we provide, they get exhausted because we I, keep I them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, <laughs> we think these are local capacity, the production of some of these things. These are all helping. But of course, we wouldn't say the situation is perfect. Okay. But and it's better than some months ago. Mm. But the call to the state, as we said, is that it will keep providing us with all the necessary logistics that we need to come back to the pandemic. And that includes the people. Okay. Well, Mr. Opongoma, that's quite a relief for you. <laughs> uh, like I was saying, that uh, tonight you haven't had headaches of uh, provision of PPE. I think it's also partly because of uh, the new model that was adopted to have these committees monitoring from the regional to the district level, which has um, the representatives of the doctors and the registered nurses uh, on it, so that we now have a clearer um, um, line of sight. And if there are any leakages, you can even begin to see where those leakages are coming from. Mm. I think recently you've seen some of the documentaries that are suggesting that it has not always been true that uh, PPEs are not being provided. Sometimes they get provided and then you have uh, some leakages in the system. But all in all, the lessons we are learning and the collaborative effort uh, appears to be improving Ghana's uh, concerted effort at winning. And I think it's also becoming quite clear that a lot of the apprehensions that were whipped up about our COVID management strategy and our ability as a people, the president talks about the us in one of his paragraphs, um, the nature of us in the last paragraph, um, our collective ability as a people to work together to win this. Despite all of those apprehensions, it's becoming clear that if we work together, if we focus, if we keep observing the preventive etiquette, we can win this battle. Mm. Well, uh, so I heard Dr. Bwadi saying that uh, it finishes and they provide. But let's get into the next batch of uh, questions uh, at this point. If they're ready, then we can quickly get responses out whilst we wrap up. So we are still on WhatsApp. Courage is asking, so are the military still at the borders? Okay, so that's the question I put to Mr. Oponkuma yes. earlier. Uh, uh, that's from Courage. We'll go on to the next one. And this one from Sarah in Takrade. Please, uh, Minister, I want to know when the GHS students will select their schools. That is their choice of SHS. Normally, they do selection of schools before writing BC. Now, Kofi Kokoko from Pando says, please ask the Minister of Information, when are the customers of the defunct fund management companies going to receive their locked up funds? We are suffering. Um, Ewa Imano, it has come to our notice that teacher trainees affiliated to UCC will resume in September to write our exams. I want uh, Honorable Okonkroma to justify if it is true or not and what measures they are putting in place for our return. Still on WhatsApp, I want to ask Dr. Abwaje if it's safe for students of a class size of 15 to wear face shields instead of nose masks. Mr. Pankuma, school selections, uh, when will it be done? Uh, usually they do it before right in BC. How come that has not happened? We are not in ordinary times, and as we are all aware. And that is why um, even for them to have the opportunity to go in and write the examinations, we've had to do all of these adjustments. I do know that the uh, Ghana Education Service working with the schools will provide a window uh, for that to take place, and they will announce that window as and when um, they are are clear on when to roll that one in. So funds locked up, keeps coming up. A lot of work has been done. So you know for the banks, for example, 100% payments, for the savings and loans and microfinance companies, about 70,000 CDs cash, 
And if you have deposits beyond that one, you are given a bond, a non-interest bearing bond for a five-year period. So you get your money, but it's over a longer period. Now, for those in the asset management companies, a lot of work has been done in validating people's claims. My understanding is that about 10 billion Ghana cities worth of claims have been put in. Then two broad categories. One category of about 5 billion, um, they've had the opportunity to validate that to, I think, somewhere around 3.3 .3 billion, which they are ready to go ahead and uh, pay. And then you have another category, which is made up of a number of companies that have been litigating the liquidation process. And that's where it gets a bit dicey. People's funds are locked up in these companies. The companies are not in a position to pay. The companies are resisting the liquidation effort. Some of them who are providing information are providing information on paper with Excel sheets, and it makes the validation process a bit difficult. But the president has instructed that this exercise needs to be completed, a cutoff point put in, so that beyond the 95 to 97 percent who have already been paid, for this smaller category of people whose funds are uh, being validated, they can finish and pay that off before uh, the year is over. The president's commitment stands. The security and agencies um, um, or the Securities and Exchanges Commission, SEC, that is doing this exercise, also completing it so that uh, they can ensure that people are paid. Okay, so teacher trainees affiliated to UCC are asking that they've been told um, to come write the exams in September. He wants you to uh, verify whether that is true or not. You would notice that from the president's address, he said that with mm. the exception of UCC and yeah. a number of institutions, many institutions have completed their examinations and therefore able to start a new academic year. Yeah. So for those accepted institutions like UCC, they are making extraordinary um, arrangements for their students to come in and complete their examinations so that they can start a new academic year. Okay. So this, this supposition will be correct and will encourage um, your tech start to get in touch with uh, the university authorities and go and complete the academic year so that they can now start uh, the new academic year. Okay, so uh, Dr. Abwaje, uh, 15 children, a class of 15, is it okay for them to wear face masks instead of um, nose masks? I, I think the gold standard is the, the face mask. Okay. They should make, wear a face mask, not a shield. Okay, so um, that's it um, there. And uh, we're going to the next match quickly then. Still on WhatsApp. And uh, this one is from who? It's coming up. So uh, please, I know someone who through contact tracing was tested for COVID-19 but hasn't gotten her results. It's been more than a month now. Mm -hmm. What is the director of Ghana Health Service doing about that? Because I heard our president this evening saying that within 48 hours you can receive your test results. What's happening? Stay on WhatsApp. Questions are jamming my system, aren't they? <laughs> okay, so um, wh whilst I get that, uh, because m your questions are many and uh, it's, uh, it's jamming my system up, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get that. So um, this issue that you've been talking about, you, you've been working on test results. And so another one, they well, had the president I, I, I talk I about think it's the, the same. not working. It's the same issue of um, all backlogs cleared. There's also the communication uh, issue. Um, when I did my test, I received my results by text. And so um, if, for example, you give, I'm just not saying that's what happened. Mm -hmm. If your text, your phone number is incorrect, you may not receive it. But I can assure you that if you are positive, they will come and look for you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so how? So it means that if you are positive, they will come and look for you. Wherever you are, they will come for you. Okay, so it means that if it's negative, that's how come we don't no, hear no, no, from no. the officials. No, 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 no. I'm saying that they are because systems. I tested them. We communicated. You communicate the results to the people. Um, uh, if you have not, just do a follow up and make sure that it's come to you. And, and that's what I would say because we really all districts are submit submit their results to the people. As soon as the tests are done. Okay, so someone is also asking, uh, can you ask the DG if it has come to his notice to request for the FDA to have a second look at the use of PCR to validate the antibody RDTs? Uh, this will fail any RDT that comes into Ghana. You aware of that? Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how they are tested. I mean, the, that's how we do the sensitivity and specificity. So far, we are not using any RDT in Ghana. Mm. And so, and that's how it goes to Noguchi and they test to see that if these people are positive, 
That's the RGT also pick it up. If they are negative, that's the RGT. And that's how they do in looking at the specificity and, and sensitivity. So that's exactly what is done. Okay. So let's um, go stay on uh, the messages um, from our audience. Uh, this one is on Facebook, I think. He says, please, um, if I ask the information minister that the one hot meal talked about by the president to the basic school, is it not too late? If the virus needed them, uh, they would have gotten it already. And so they should stop spending money that is difficult to account for. Anaba and uh, Philemon uh, sent that one on Facebook. So uh, he's saying, now, or she's saying, that is it not too late? Um, <laughs> if the virus needed them, they would have gotten it already. And that we should stop wasting money on um, things we cannot account for. Do we have Kojo? I'm here, Mifa. Can you hear me? Yes. So that question uh, yeah. or a comment or so on Facebook. Yes. Or yes. You. The president does not consider the giving of relief or support or the provision of the protective virus. items to people as a waste of resources. It is necessary. And we believe that even one day of risk is one day risky. And if keeping them on campus to be fed is necessary to reduce one day of risk, the president believes that it should be done. It will be done. But are you able to help me here? Uh, the issue about pubs um, and then uh, beer bars, what actually is the difference? Because I've seen some already operating, even though we are told that um, they, are not, they are supposed to remain closed. What really uh, is the differentiation here? If I understand it clearly, the outdoor pubs have the open area and the ventilation, etc. But even for those ones, you're supposed to observe the preventive etiquette. The clubs are the ones that we used to call the discos or the discotheques. You have an enclosed room um, with people packed in and um, a lot of music, shouting to get on top of the music for people to hear you, alcohol, etc. Those ones have not been opened yet. But the open air pubs where you can sit out and have a, a chilled bottle is uh, what has been allowed currently. But are you satisfied with what you've seen so far in terms of compliance? Are these open air pubs, um, for instance, uh, because we, we've seen some the last time we are on, you saw a number of them somewhere complying, but it looks like that's not happening again. I think the jury is still out there. The early observation suggests that some were, or a good number of persons were complying. Uh, the Ghana Health Service, has, they have demonstrated today, and as the president uh, read out to the country, mm -hmm. is compiling the data so that we have empirical understanding of how much is being observed in these places. Yeah. So between the early observation and the next data set that um, they will bring, I'll say the jury is out, but we'll only continue to encourage. And as Dr. Boaji has been saying, we are only doing so well because we are all complying. The day we stop is the day we increase our risk. And so it's important that we all comply um, so that we continue to win this battle. Mm. So let, let's talk about your um, data that you provided the president. We are talking about it earlier yeah. uh, before we went for the address. Um, he's talking about 82% possessing a face mask, mm -hmm. um, rather high, um, he describes it. But the figures in terms of those who are actually wearing it and using it properly as a health service, you're satisfied with that data? Oh, no, we are, we are not. But we, that's why we're going to continue our risk communication to improve. Those who are wearing correctly is about 44 points percent. And that mm -hmm. is something we need to, to improve. We also did some of the markets. And we realized that um, some of the markets um, are doing better than others. And so we're engaging them to ensure that they can improve uh, the use uh, of. Uh, so we look at several streets and then well, some common areas that we checked, and then we also look at that. We go to the same place again uh, after a week or so to see what has happened. Has it increased? Has it come down? So that we know how to, 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 to respond to, to, to mm. them. And that's something we're really going to continue to do in across the country. We've asked the other regions to also, especially the regions where the risks are high, to also continue doing that and engage the people so that we can inc increase the compliance. Mm. The but, but in speaking to them, uh, because you had quite a high number possessing it, but 44%, um, almost half of them not wearing it or, or using it properly. What did they say was the reason during that, that survey? We, we are doing another one now to look mm -hmm. at some of the reasons. Some of the earlier ones we are talking about difficulty in breathing and etc. And also, some people don't just don't know that they are supposed to cover their nose as well, mm. and not just their mouth. And so those are, that's why we are happy with the intention to use, which is the 82%. 
The next thing is to educate people so that they can wear them appropriately and at the appropriate places so that we can also get the benefits of them having a mask and not just holding or just putting it under your jaw. It's a very common practice. But, but Dr. Abwaje, really, um, let's be real. Uh, there are those who say that with the cases that uh, we have seen so far, with the fast decline, COVID is, is, is not as scary no, as it used to be. No, that's what yeah. I keep saying. Mm -hmm. You are wearing masks, mm -hmm. I'm wearing masks. That's why the rest is low. If you stop wearing the mask, nobody knows what will happen. And that is what is... So to keep it down, we need to keep this new norm. It's extremely important, the social distancing. Some say it's become like Qatar. It's just something that... <laughs> oh, you <laughs> see, just... it's... Um, there's a lot of things that we will learn about the disease. Yeah. And so, don't say, because I'm an asymptomatic, nothing. nobody knows what, what deficit is going to leave behind. And we'll, we'll, we'll learn. Uh, in future to see what are the real effects, even for those who are not, uh, who do not show signs. And so it is important that everybody prevents it. And the most important, if I get it and I'm strong, and I give it to somebody who is not strong, that person may succumb. And that is why it is important that protect your neighbor by protecting yourself. And that is something I want to uh, get everybody to know that even if you feel that you are not at risk, protect the next person who may be at risk. And mm. it's important that we keep that uh, going as we move into trying to improve access to work, everything, which is extremely important, but we cannot uh, do that if we are careless and we start getting another surge and everybody has to go back into their rooms and hide. We don't want to get there. So we want to ensure that this is done. And we are happy that not only are the positives going down, the people in admissions are, I'm just getting, yeah. the TUC in Kumasi is virtually closed down, empty. Many places are down, but we need to keep it that way okay. by doing what we are doing now or even doing more mm. because we are, we are not zero. We want to go to zero mm. so that we can all uh, have our life back. You, ha you had a focus on, on workplaces. How is it look, looking like? Are the figures uh, it, it's, it's good now. It's good now. I think it was a good lesson that we learned. And so, like I keep saying, <laughs> workplace is like a big crowd in mm. small place. Once you move the walls, it's one big crowd. And so... Uh, a lot of lessons have been learned, new protocols have been put in, chief directors have engaged themselves, other workers have engaged themselves, and so things are, we are not getting. Most of the spikes in June was also, and Sigan and I were coming from workplaces. Mm. So, well, sorry I didn't inform you, but that's your, your final comments uh, <laughs> for the show. But uh, Dr. Justice Yang Singh and uh, Mr. Kojo Ponkuma are still with me, also via Zoom. Dr. Yang Singh, uh, in wrapping up, um, I've been asking uh, Dr. Patrick Abwaji, there are those who say that, well, with all that we've seen, I heard you alluding to that earlier also, that um, COVID, um, it looks like it's just gone. Because uh, what we are seeing now, uh, they are watching you now, let's inform them about why mm. we need to continue uh, to be, you know, protective and then also observe the safety protocols. Okay, let me find. Uh, I, I think every citizen of this land understand that. One, as a country, we've done a lot to combat the pandemic up to this point. We've made a lot of gains. But the key thing is that, one, we are not out of the room each and every person must understand. We started off with one case, and that one case has moved all the way to 40,000 plus. Now we still have active cases a little below 2,000. If we don't keep our guard properly, and we let loose whatever we are gaining now, what it means is that all these active cases and probably others that we are yet to take are just going to have a rebound effect on all of us. And usually in pandemics, when you have that rebound effect, like some countries are experiencing, that tends to be deadly than even the first wave. So we shouldn't fall into the trap of the second wave. And if we are to do that, then what we mean is that mm -hmm. we all properly go along with the mentality that, look, the disease is real, the disease is still with us, for which reason we need to respect all the preventive etiquette. So social distancing, the wearing of masks, washing of hands, use of sanitizer, every bit of it we need to continue to observe them. Okay. Even though we are easing up, like I said earlier, we should not think that 
and it's over. You need to comply with the protocol to be able to have a complete eradication of the virus from our community. Okay. And until we do that, we cannot say that everything is fine. Okay. We keep seeing patients who walk into the health facility very ill. It hasn't ended. We still have people who are losing their lives out of COVID. It hasn't ended. Mm. Today, if somebody, if you don't protect yourself, it could be you. Mm. So please, please, please bear in mind that COVID is still with us. It okay. is real. For which reason we should adhere to all the preventive measures as outside. Well, to you, uh, Mr. Ponkuma, uh, finally, uh, you shared uh, podiums, uh, for instance, with the education minister, uh, health minister. They all uh, got COVID at some point. Uh, we never heard that you got it. And maybe it's a good time uh, to share with the audience how you survived it, uh, because others uh, came, we passed through uh, the Ministry of Information, and they got it. And then also the reduction in the numbers of the press conferences. People feel that as a result, it means that um, COVID, let's just relax. Are you, are, you, are you suggesting that the Ministry of Information podium was a spreading point? <laughs> no, it could be an epicenter at some point, because at least two main ministers were there and they got it. No, um, <laughs> I think that um, I've been lucky um, because for many of my colleagues, they have observed the preventive etiquette, but in the line of duty elsewhere, um, they have oh, caught safe. it. Thankfully, they've recovered. So I think I've been lucky. Uh, I've tested, I think, over six times or so. All of them have been um, negative. Uh, so I just feel lucky. Um, mm. But I'll continue to do what I have to do to protect okay. uh, myself. Mm -hmm. I think last last week or so, we had a number of holidays, uh, which fell on the days when we were supposed to have our briefings. Okay. And so we did not do those briefings. This week, we expect to resume. On Tuesday, for example, we're having um, a government town hall meeting on infrastructure and development. So that will affect our COVID briefing. But on Thursday... And then moving forward, I think on Thursdays, mm. uh, you see our okay. COVID briefings um, repeated. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Abadji, I'm told that uh, all positives, we don't get it. Is it true? No, that's not that I know. <laughs> okay. All right, and yeah, that's it uh, for tonight's edition of Beyond the Lockdown. I am MFR Power. Dr. Patrick Baji is the Director General of Ghana Health, Health Service. He's been my guest. General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Dr. Justice Yang Singh, was also on. And then, of course, the Information Minister, Kujo Ponkroma, they've been my guest. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Enjoy your week. There's more news when you log on to myjoyonline.com. On behalf of the entire production team, Jojo Kopna and the rest of the team, thank you so much. Another edition of Beyond the Lockdown comes up on next Sunday. Thank you.